Welcome to the lecture number 15 of this course, Basics of Fluorescent Spectroscopy. In uh, lecture 14, right, so what we were discussing is the solvent effect of uh, fluorescence and in that regard, what we have seen is that uh, lippard mataga equation, right. And in that lippard mataga equation, what ultimately we have seen is that uh, if we take the fluorescence spectra of your molecule right, as a function of different solvent and then function of different solvent is uh, given by the two quantity is uh, directly constant and the refractive index where the orientational polarizability is expressed as uh, epsilon minus 1 by twice epsilon plus 1 minus n square minus 1 by twice m n square plus 1. So, in that case we will get a straight line and uh, from that slope we will be able to calculate uh, the excited state dipole moment if ground state dipole moment is known or ground state dipole moment if excited state dipole moment is known provided that A that is the radius of the cavity is known to us uh, priori. So, then I argued that uh, okay, so if uh, we want to uh, measure the excited state dipole moment then from uh, some other technique that right, we need to know that what is the value of the ground state dipole moment obviously, those techniques are available. But what I wanted to show you today that if we and e eventually we have started uh, the last day that if we just rewrite that equations right which we have already derived in a different form then the situation uh, which will come will uh, be so interesting that we will be able to measure the ground and the uh, excited state dipole moment together right. So, in that regard what we ultimately uh, got is these two equation. The first one is that uh, new absorption new bar right minus new bar emission is equal to twice mu e minus mu g whole square by h c a cube right here this c is because it is in the wave number into epsilon minus 1 by twice epsilon plus 1 minus n square minus 1 by twice n square plus 1 plus that c right that c is uh, for our uh, inherent stock shift in the molecule right. And also we have seen that if we take this new bar absorption plus new bar emission right then what you will going to get is minus twice mu e square minus mu g square divided by h c a cube into epsilon minus 1 by twice epsilon plus 1 plus n square minus 1 by twice n square plus 1 and we will get some other constant right c prime. So, here what uh, you can see this this first one is nothing but lippert mataga equation right the first one is nothing but lippert mataga equation and the second one I just did that uh, new bar absorption plus new bar emission. So, in this case what we will going to get is a negative slope right negative slope. So, let us write this as this is equal to let us uh, say this is equal to m 1 m 1 right uh, that is my slope epsilon minus 1 by twice epsilon plus 1 minus n square minus 1 by twice n square plus 1 plus c and this will going to be equal to minus m 2 only this function will be different here is minus, but here will be plus epsilon minus 1 by right plus c prime. Okay. So, now if I plot these two 
the first one is new bar absorption minus new bar emission, then I will get a line like that way. So, slope will going to be this one right and if I plot new bar absorption plus new bar emission. then you will get the line like this way and here slope will be equal to m 2. Okay. Now, I, I can tell you that uh, one formula, right? I, let, let me write one formula over here and uh, if I put this value and we will see what will come. right? If I now calculate m 2 minus m 1 divided by 2 into h c a cube by twice m 1 to the power half. If I write that, then I know the value of m 2, the value of m 1, m 1 is uh, twice mu v minus mu g whole square by h c a cube like that and uh, m 2 is uh, twice mu e square minus mu g square by h c a cube like that. So, I can simply uh, plug in all the value, all the expression of m 1 and m 2 in this equation and simplify it, right. So, that you can uh, just write it over here. Uh, so, m 2 is twice mu e square minus mu g square by h c a cube minus m 1 is twice mu v minus mu g whole square by h c a cube. That whole thing is divided by, so this is, that whole thing is divided by 2 and then I have this quantity, right, h c a cube. divided by twice m 1. No? So, then m 1 is twice mu v minus mu g square by h c a cube. Right? I have this. If I simplify this, what you will going to see is this is nothing but mu g that you can do it later. So, upon simplification of this expression, what you will get this is equal to mu g. That means, that means if I know this two slope, right, this slope, this m 1 and m 2 separately, right, then what I will going to get? I will get this mu g. Once mu g is known, right, mu v will be known automatically. Hmm. So, there is no problem. So, we can measure the ground and excess state of the moment by using the solvent dependent uh, change in the fluorescence spectra. Right? Okay. So, uh, as you can see that in this uh, plot, right, in this plot, so here is my new bar absorption minus new bar emission versus that F bar. Uh, typically, we will write F r and uh, you know that this is a function of dielectric constant constantly refractive index, which is nothing but epsilon minus 1 by twice epsilon plus 1 like this form. right? So, uh, for different different molecule, right, this feature will be different. right? So, for some molecule, if this feature is like this, for the other molecule, this feature may be uh, something different, is something like this. Right? So, looking at these two molecules, let us say the molecule here, what I am uh, drawn, the dependence is this molecule. And 
and this molecule is this one. Right. In this case, I got the slope is more compared to the other. Right. It simply means that the change in the excited state dipole moment from the or, or, or the change in the dipole moment that means, mu v minus mu g is more for the molecule this one. So, mu e minus mu g is high that is change in the dipole moment is more where the dependence is more right where the dependence is more. Okay. So, while uh, discussing this I have taken one inherent assumption on this. What is that assumption? The assumption is this solvent right will create a reaction field because of the induced dipole moment by the solute dipole. Right. So, induced dipole by the solute dipole it is the uh, it will create a reaction field R. Right. And then we use that R for the derivation of this lippert matag equation and the extension of the lippert matag equation. But we have uh, not explicitly said, but it is true that we have not uh, taken into account any specific solvent interaction. If there is any specific solvent interaction, that means the solvent is actually interacting by hydrogen bonding or any other means with the solute molecule, then all this description of this uh, solvent dependent emission spectra or solvent dependent fluorescence uh, are not going to be correct. Right? So, this whatever I have discussed this lippert matag equation is under the condition that the solvent will not going to have a specific interaction, right? solvent will not going to have a specific interaction with the solute molecule. So, this is true when there is no specific solute solvent interaction. Right? If there is a specific solute solvent interaction, let me let me show you one molecule. Uh, this uh, specific solute solvent uh, for, for this molecule, this is a very famous example. Right. This is uh, for this molecule. If you change the solvent, right? The solvent is uh, let's say ethanol water mixture, right? So you can tune the reality constant, the refractive index uh, nicely. So in this case, the change, the, the change in the emission spectra of this molecule will be enormous for very low concentration of ethanol, right? If I if I may draw briefly over here and this is that uh, lambda right emission and this is my intensity of fluorescence right i can represent as i or a whatever you want so when it is uh, like uh, pure water what you will get this emission is something like this right this maximum is around here is around 400 nanometer, here is around 450 nanometer. With a very small amount of ethanol, the spectra will shift right drastically. So, a small amount of ethanol, the spectra will shift to like this, only 3 percent of ethanol. Now, if I change the ethanol concentration to 100 percent, there will be not much change in the emission maxima. Right? So, when I change this to 100 percent, this will be something like this. That means, somehow uh, this uh, molecule is interacting, this interacting with ethanol and in this case we cannot apply this 
Lippert Mathaka equation for this molecule. So, specific interaction has to be uh, should not be present right between the solute and the solvent. Then this Lippert Mathaka equation is valid and we can easily measure the ground state dipole moment and the excited state dipole moment right using the solvent dependency of the emission or fluorescence spectra right. There is another catch over here another uh, condition over here that condition let me let me uh, write it uh, or let me explain it using this diagram um, over here so this is my ground state of this molecule right let me uh, write it as s0 and i have excited this molecule h nu absorption and I have created this excited state. This excited state, so here is my H nu absorption that we already have calculated over here. This excited state will stabilize because of the solvent reorientation, right, that we already have seen, and then th that is why this F over is applicable, right, after when I am talking about this emission part. So, let us say this is my stabilization till here is my stabilization my stabilization and then emission is taking place from here lambda emission or h nu emission h nu emission right now from here to here so coming from this state to this state right there will be a numerous number of steps depending on the specific solvent reorientation around the solute dipole if this process is much much faster than the lifetime of the state lifetime of the state is about nanosecond that i have said this is about 10 to the power minus 9 second and if this process starting from this state is 1 unsolvated right and this S1 solvated. So, from this to this state if the time scale is much much faster then this emission right will be provided only by this stabilized energy state. If this process, if from here to here, if this process, right, if this process is slower, right, then from each and every state will contribute to the fluorescence. So, whatever I said, this is uh, true when, when I have this process is much faster than this process, right. So, in uh, bulk water, right in water or in uh, this process, this process is about picosecond, 1 picosecond. In methanol is water, in methanol this is about 4 picosecond. So, obviously, this is about 1000 times faster, right. And so, in uh, for every day, I have no issue, I can get these things done. But, but if you use a viscous solvent right like ionic liquids and several other viscous solvents are available if you use a viscous solvent then this emission right will also get a contribution from these different intermediate states let's take let's let, let's ask the question in a different way if you really want to get the information of this state that means what you're going to see is emission at zero time from here nothing has been solvated no energy minimization because of the reorientation of the solvent after some time there will be little bit reorientation of the solvent so now the emission will be not uh, this much of energy but emission will be like this much of energy after some time emission will be this much of energy and at the end emission will be this much of energy it means that with time the emission spectra will shift shift towards the longer wavelength or red side right so 
it means that if you can somehow take the or if you can somehow measure the emission spectra as in a time resolved mode. That means, immediately after excitation, if this is my emission spectra, after some time that could be 1 picosecond, that could be 100 femtosecond, that could be 1 nanosecond depending on your system. If you can measure, then what you are going to see is that the gradual shift in the emission spectra, right? gradual shift of the emission spectra as time goes. So, basically what you are going to see is the following time resolved emission spectra. Right? So, initially at early time your emission spectra is something like this as time goes emission spectra will shift to the longer wavelength here is my wavelength axis over here and here is your intensity right as time goes your emission spectra will shift 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 and when things are at this position things are at this position then there will be no longer shift then even you change the time there will be no longer shift that means what i said this is T 1 let us say, this is T 2 let us say, this is T 3, this is T 4, this is T 5. Here T 5 is greater time than T 4, greater than T 3, T 2, T 1. right? Here this emission spectra are different, but for these two, these em two emission spectra are very same. That means, it has reached this uh, my fully solvated state. That means, after that time there is no longer uh, any uh, solvation taking place. That means, it is reached the uh, most stabilized state uh, and uh, that state what we have uh, seen in our lippert mataka equation. Right? So, now question is that if I want to get such kind of uh, time resolved emission spectra, right? then that normal uh, steady state emission spectra is not good enough. right? because that will going to give me the integrated value of all these emission spectra. right? That will going to give me the integrated value of all these emission spectra. So, my question is how we are going to get that? How we are going to get this time resolved emission spectra? If I will be able to measure the time resolved emission spectra, I will be able to see the formation of this state through the intermediate states. right? And that is a very uh, interesting topic and uh, the time scale of uh, going from this this state to this state right is known as the solvation time right? and the dynamics is known as the solvation dynamics right so eventually by this we will get the solvation dynamics of the solvent of your choice right as i said that in water it is about a picosecond and as you change the solvent to methanol, it increase right 4 picosecond, 5 picosecond right and so on and so forth. Okay. So, now let me briefly discuss uh, this thing that how we are going to measure this time resolved emission spectra. Okay, so, I think the time is uh, almost up. So, before starting that how we are going to measure the time resolved emission spectra, let me repeat what I said using uh, a diagram that means that uh, when I excite my system from here to here. These are my intermediate states, right? that is what and this is my final state, fully solvated state. So, every time I is going to measure, I is going to measure the emission like this, 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 this. right? So, here I will get emission spectra like this way and in this case, this will be shifted to the red side, red side, red side and after some time this will remain same. Okay, as time is up, so I will finish here and in the next class what I will going to uh, do is uh, I will show you that uh, how we will going to uh, calculate this uh, time resolved emission spectra from the measured uh, emission intensity as well as the lifetime measurement. Earlier, what I said you that 
the, th the four different parameter of fluorescence, right. You remember I said that emission the intensity, I said the quantum yield, right i or f. So, this is denoted by phi f. I also said the emission maxima generally denoted as lambda emission max and I also said the lifetime fluorescence lifetime right this is denoted by tau f and I also showed you that this tau f is nothing but 1 over k r plus k n r radiative and non radiative path process pathway. So, but I have not uh, told you that how we will going to measure this lifetime right and this is important to get this time resolved emission spectra. So, we have to measure the lifetime right. So, the measurement of lifetime is important in our case. There are two way we can measure the lifetime. The first one is uh, in the frequency domain measurement and the second one is the time domain measurement. I am not going to discuss the frequency domain measurement in this course, but I will discuss the time domain measurement in this course. In time domain measurement, the idea is very simple that you excite your sample with a short light pulse and now let us monitor the how the fluorescence intensity will change as a function of time. right? And uh, with this let me finish here and we will continue on the next lecture. Thank you very much.